Welcome to another episode of Conversations. I'm Mikkel Brand Challenger. Happy to have you in this space. Conversations is an initiative of the Caribbean Football Union under our Girls Play Football campaign, where we're spotlighting women and girls in football. Today, we're touching down in the land of wood and water to speak with the trailblazing referee assistant, Stephanie Dale Yeasing. She's one of the leading ladies of Caribbean football with several marquee moments, including but not limited to being a part of the female duo first from the region, male or female, to officiate in a FIFA World Cup final. That was the women's under 17 in 2018. She was added again a year later in 2019, officiating in the semifinals of the Women's World Cup. And just recently, she made history, CONCACAF history that is, as part of an all-women panel refereeing in a men's game in the Caribbean Club Championship. And she's also shortlisted for the Women's World Cup in 2023 in Australia and New Zealand. Join me after this break for our conversation with the amazing Stephanie. They say I can do anything, just not this. That I'm not cut out for the rough and tumble. That it's unladylike and people will call me a tomboy. They say this is a phase I must outgrow because there's no future here for me. They say many things. But I look at Stephanie Dale Yee Singh and Princess Brown, Akila Mullen, Wendy Renard, the Jamaica Reggae Girls, and the women on pitches across the Caribbean, on college campuses, and wearing their national colors. Committed and proud. The exceptional ones. The journey women and the ones who simply feel alive on the pitch. They can't place limitations on me. Because right here is where I choose to be. Welcome to Conversation, Stephanie. Happy to have you. How are you? I'm good, thank you. It's a pleasure. All right. Now, we're going to just jump right into it. Before you were an assistant referee making waves, you were a player. So how old were you when you started in football? Uh, maybe around 10, 10, 11. I started playing in prep school with the boys. And then when I went to high school, um, still played with the boys, but not competitively. Uh, they had this mini competition in high school for girls. This is when girls football just started, like back in 2002, somewhere there in Jamaica. Um, and the coach saw me playing and invited me to come and join the team. So I didn't want to go at first because I'm shy. I'm a little reserved. So I didn't go until the summer or a few months after. And then I just started playing like, how many years now? Many years. How many years? So it's over 10 years. Well, for sure. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. So back then yeah. when you were playing, was it just for fun you liked it or did you have aspirations in football? It really was just for fun. But like the thought did come to mind to maybe represent Jamaica at that level. But it wasn't like a goal, you know? If the opportunity came up, I would have been really happy. To participate okay so then how did you go from playing football to being in the position where you are refereeing and being a fifa assistant referee and and just making all these waves as we've said before <laughs> it's a weird story because i really didn't like referees i really didn't i wasn't into referees at all even uh I don't know if you know, Carola Samuels, a former FIFA referee from Jamaica, she used to referee my games as a player and we didn't always get along. Uh, but <laughs> but um, yeah, my cousin, who is also a FIFA referee from Jamaica, he invited me to training because uh, he knew me as a player and he said to me one day, like, what are your plans after you finish with football? I'm like, I'm going to start life and just, you know, because there's nothing more for me in football as a player. So he said, why don't you, I said, I'd like to give back to football, maybe going to coaching, because I used to help on my high school team. And he said, why don't you try to give back in a different capacity? So he said, try refereeing. I'm like, mm, no, 
people like have so many bad things to say about referees. Spectators hate you. I don't want nobody to hate me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he was like, just try. So I said, okay. I started going to training and like even in the training, I just tried to make it fun because it was so weird holding up a flag or signaling with the hands. You know, as a player, you used to keeping your hands down and just running and kicking the ball. But no, you have to do different stuff. So it was really weird. But then I adjusted and I began to like it till I fell in love with it because um, it helped with my traveling as well. Because in school, I did hospitality and tourism. So um, it all just meshed or came together. That's great. But then you went to University of Technology and you studied tourism and hospitality. And that's an indication that you were going to move in a completely different direction for a career. So how did that path change leading to where you are today? Uh, oh, OK. Uh, as I said, I'm a traveler. I like to travel. So even while in school, as a part of our internship at UTEC, um, we had to sometimes some of us traveled. So my intention was to still travel the world after school. But football allowed me a way to still travel while doing what I love also, which is football. So as I said before, it all worked together because as I got football, got to travel, maybe not the way that I intended to for my studies, but it just all fell into place somehow. All right. So we know that you are a standard bearer for a lot of us in the Caribbean, whether you're a woman, a girl, a boy, whether you're Jamaican, the CONCACAF, CFU, wherever. Tell us a, lot, a bit now about your journey. You've had some amazing highlights um, standing in um, World Cup finals, the first with a duel from as a duel from Jamaica, male or female. You've been to the Women's World Cup. You had a historic moment just the other day, and you're also shortlisted for the 2023 World Cup. So tell us about some of these highlights of this amazing career. Oh, wow. It's been, I can't say magical now, because when you look back on it, it really is magical. Like some of the things that I have managed to achieve, to me, it's still unbelievable. Because going on the FIFA list in my first year, I went to a CONCACAF final round, a championship, the under 20s. And I was a part of the final in that first year. And then the, sec the following year, that's when... I was a part of the on the CONCACAF on the 17 final run as well and did a final there as well. Went to Jordan a couple months after for the first um for my first World Cup, uh, on the 17 women's World Cup, after which um still getting some experience and you know um improving my performance the following year. And the other artists, uh, my trio, did the final for that World Cup. Oh, I forgot, in Jordan, we did the semi-final of that under-17 World Cup, right? Um, teams like Japan and Spain, like I've only seen them on TV, you know? And to see them in real life, to see all these girls in real life, even going to France the year after Uruguay, um, being introduced to all these national players from Sweden, Netherlands, England, um, Germany, China. Like, as I said, I only see them on TV. So like to see them up close and personal, it was really great, a really great experience. And then being in the tunnel with them, everybody was nervous, including us, you know, and hearing the, the, the music, getting ready to walk out. And my friend said, are you ready? And I'm like, okay. Yes. <laughs> so it was all just like, uh, my heart was beating so fast. Hearing their national anthem, not even mine, it was just amazing. And then the crowd in the background and you're like, I've never seen so many people in my life, but <laughs> you still have to perform. But after that whistle goes and you get into it, 
like everything just goes. It's just the green pitch and the players in front of you. What does it feel like? And you have described being in the tunnel and getting out there, but that moment when you hear your name called and you're on this international stage, what what, what are the emotions like? Uh, my heart probably sank a little bit. <laughs> Why? <laughs> <laughs> because it was it was overwhelming it really was like to just know that you're there you know like to make it that far so just to make it that far was it for me everything else that came after was like bonus yeah it was just like a plus for me what does it mean? And some of this, you've been there, you you, you did it um, when you were in Uruguay with a compatriot, you had Princess Brown with you. Do you guys ever look over at each other and say, this is surreal? Are there tears? Are you fighting emotion? What's that? Always. There has been a lot of tears. Like, we couldn't believe it. Like, all the hard work that we, we put in back home, um, the sacrifices that we've made, uh, you know, going through rain, hot weather, um, not having pitches to train on, stuff like that, or not having any football, like even in times like these, you when you look back on everything that you had to struggle through or come up through and you've reached the goal, like it's just unbelievable that you actually went through all of that just to get here. And it was an overwhelming feeling, like it was mind blowing. You know, you just forget about everything that happened and say, okay, this is it. So you were talking about standing on the world stage um, and thinking about the distance that you've come from. What have been some of the toughest hurdles that you've had to surmount? (sighs) Wow. There are many, there are many. Um, Where to start? Fitness wise, of course, they tell us that fitness, let me start with fitness. Fitness is extremely important. Um, As you can see that even to officiate in the men's game in in 2021, in this day and age, you have to pass the men's fitness test. You have to be able to rise to the occasion and um, you know, keep up with the pace of the game. So in order for us to participate in these games and to be treated fairly or equally, we have to match up to the men and show them what we're capable of. You know, we have to show them that, hey, I can do what you do without any form of offense or disrespect, of course, but like let them know we can do what you do even though we are females. Right. Um, so that was a challenge competing against friendly rivalry against our male counterparts. <laughs> um, uh, also, uh, technically and theoretically, sometimes it's a challenge when you have amendments to the laws of the game. Um, every year we have to relearn or we have to adapt um, to all the changes and then apply them in the game. So the practice is very important on the field. So whatever we learn in the classroom, we still have to come back and put it into practice on the field, into games. And um, as they teach us back home in Jamaica, training should always reflect the game. So everything that we do, the intensity that we put out, um, everything should be applied to the game. So you were, you were part of that all women's panel in the men's game in the Caribbean Club Championship the other day. And you spoke about having to pass the men's fitness test yeah. to referee. For those of us who don't know, what's the difference between the women's fitness test and the men's fitness test? Ah, okay. For the women... We have two times for the referee. It is 1720. Run 1720 seconds in run 17 seconds in 75 meters. You rest for 20 seconds. For the assistant referees, you run 17 seconds and I think you rest 
22 seconds um, over 75 meters, but that's like 40 runs. Plus we have to do some sprints, about five to six sprints over 30 to 40 meter distance. And uh, a sister referee drill called a coda, where we have to do, you see us in games doing lateral movements and a lot of sprinting. But for the referee, the time is reduced. So they run, the men's test, sorry, they run 15 seconds. So it's two seconds shorter. And the rest is also shorter. So now we, as women, would have to run faster to keep up with that pace um, and to be able to participate. So once we can get over that hurdle, the men's fitness test, then performance-wise on the pitch, we can, you know, do the same as them. <laughs> so what is your fitness regimen like on a day-to-day -day basis to keep you match fit and to be able to pass any test that's thrown at you? Uh, well, right now, we have programs from FIFA, from CONCACAF, and even in our Caribbean region here um, that we have to follow. And being a part of the pool of women that has been shortlisted for the Women's World Cup coming up in 2023, follow certain, certain regimes. So we have a lot of variations that we have to um to fill in each week or to overcome each week, like agility, speed, endurance, high intensity. Um, but we train like, for me, like five to six days per week because there's not much football or any football going on in Jamaica. So I have to replace a game day with extra training. Um, and I try, personally, I try to incorporate game situations or practical field situations into the training so I get a feel of the game just the same even though there is no football going on. Okay um, tell me about when you're out there in the middle you have to keep the updated regulations you're thinking about your fitness you're thinking about doing it right is there any anxiety about ensuring that you make the right call or that there are no errors and what happens there? Well, actually, being on the line, um, as, a, as assistant referees, I can speak for assistant referees, it's actually a pretty hard job. Um, always staying in line with the second last opponent, uh, knowing when the ball was touched or last played by uh, the teammate of a player that may be in an offside position. Um, you, I don't know, the pace of the game, uh, seeing if there's an infraction happening on the field and being a, a meticulous person, like you want to get everything right. You want to be a perfectionist because a person, a, a player can be like one meter offside position. And when the ball is passed and if you're not in the correct position to get that decision, then, you know, mm, you're going to get lashes for that if that person scores a goal. So like, you just try your best always not to make any, any bad decisions in the game. Like, personally, I, I, I cry sometimes. <laughs> I think it's a female thing. But I, I cry when I do make bad decisions in the game because it's not my intention because I really want to always just do my best. So then when that happens, you go back. How do you process or how do you not let that have a negative impact on you or stay with you for such a long time that it, it, it um, has an effect on your performance going forward? What's that process like? Um, well, in the game, after that has passed, you have to just shake it off and go again because we have the rest of the game to go. So you have to learn how to mentally put it behind you quickly. But then after the game, no, like you feel really bad and you kind of sulk. And as I say, sometimes I cry, but I reflect on it and I try to find out what did I do wrong? And then I work towards fixing this so it doesn't happen again. All right. Have you ever been in a situation where you had concern for your safety or you felt that it was hostile? Yes. 
I, I get a lot of that in Jamaica, or at least I used to get a lot of that in Jamaica. Um, I remember a famous incident back home. Uh, I think it was my first semifinal game in a men's competition back home. And like, like I said earlier, I'm a, a little perfectionist. So in that moment, with that situation, like I saw the player in the offside position, a shot was taken and it passed his teammate onside and went to him in an onside position, offside position, sorry. And he took a shot and the team ended up scoring from that build up. But then my flag went up. In that moment, I didn't think that, oh, there were a lot of people behind me or, you know, any harm could come to me. I just went up with the flag because I'm doing the right thing. That's what I'm focused on. And then immediately, like two huge guys came over me, like in my face. That's an offside. And I'm like, this is all I could do. <laughs> so imagine a tall person here and a short person here doing this a stop sign signal, which is one of CONCACAF's, um, a CONCACAFism right now across the, the region. So, um, yeah, and during the game, they had to send police to watch my back for the rest of the game because, as I said, the game has to continue after that incident has passed. And it, it, it never once placed doubt in that moment in my head that maybe the decision was wrong or concern for my safety because I didn't even see the, the police or the security personnel that came around. I was just still focused on the game. So that was a plus, meaning I stayed focused. But then my so it was after the fact reflecting, I was like, all of that actually happened, you know. And then how do you go back and process? Does it do you say, man, I'm not sure about this, or do you say another day at the office? Uh, some days, some days I, I do have that thought, like, is this really for me? You know, um, do I really want this? Or I say, God, why am I here? Like some things that you actually go through, you really question, is this really for you? But at the end of the day, the reward from it, it kind of supersedes all the negatives or all the bad feeling or, yeah basically like it outweighs it all right rewards outweigh all the that come in yeah and speaking about the reward outweighing the negatives what are some of the awards and accolades that you have received and do any of them hold an extra special place in your heart all of them all of them i think it's been an amazing journey uh, i can't pinpoint just one because everything that has happened for myself, for my colleagues, um, even Princess, like I don't think of it as just individual. I think of it wholesome for all of us and our achievements as women. Um, even though my training, one of my training partners, Jessica, she's in been she's been invited to the Gold Cup. So that might not have been my personal achievement, but it is still a great achievement for all of us as women because we are sharing it together, especially back home when all of that we have to come up through. We've been each other's support some of the times um, and then being there with Princess, you know, at the World Cup, she's been a guide to me. Also, like a lot of things that I've learned along the way, uh, big, like a big sister, so I really appreciate all of those moments. So you just referenced it. What's it like having a squad? You know, um, of course, you would have that with other women you meet when you travel for competition. But you have a team of compatriots who are on this journey. Some of them started it before you. Some of them are going through. What's it like to have a team of people to understand and to, to lean on and to help motivate each other? It's been good, but of course, you know, women are women, so we do have our ups and downs, but it's been really good. It's been, we've been each other's support system because a woman would more understand how a woman feels. 
the men might not always understand what we're going through and the encouragement that we get from other or fellow women the feeling like okay i probably can't say that part on air but um, yeah, just some <laughs> just some of the things that we would go through as women another woman would understand it more than a man so um like we just learn how to encourage each other. I don't know how to explain it, but we just learn how to encourage each other and be each other's drive. Because in terms of, for example, go back to fitness, um, Jessett is really fit. So um, I always tell her that I try to run her down. She's my, she's my marker, like to pull me or to push me to be better all the time you know and even princess herself like sometimes we'll be running and training and be like come on Steffi or we some days we don't even feel like training but they're like come we have to go today you know so we just try to be there for each other the best way possible and hope that we all will achieve the same at the end of the day okay you get out there it's game day there are all this these nerves, you have adrenaline, the internal expectations, the external expectations, maybe there's pressure. How do you calm down and get in the zone to tune out all the white noise to get the job done? Ah, question. It's all about preparation. So not only physical preparation, but mental and psychological preparation. So you get yourself in a zone. Um, Even the other day uh, with um, Tori, the referee that I was with in the men's game the other day, uh, she had a playlist. And when she was playing her songs, I'm like, those are the same songs I have on my playlist. So we started to vibe, started to enjoy ourselves a little in the changing room and chill, you know? So we, we had that energy going from before. So we weren't so much focused on, okay, this game is going to be really intense and, you know, getting nerves in and butterflies and stuff like that. Like we were just chilling. I just, we were still focused on the game, but that's how we dealt with it. Like we got this woman power. We're going to do this. This is how we found our strength in each other. And it was good that we were able to share that moment. Not only us, the whole crew, because it was just a vibe, you know? And we already, like mentally we think about things that we want to do on the pitch things that we want to get right should they happen so you envision yourself like okay I'm going to get this offside decision right this throw right this first corner kick right everything like that so it's all about the preparation especially from the mind and after you're done with the match it's been the high intensity you get back to your hotel room how do you decompress Ah, the bed. <laughs> tired. <laughs> so tired. Uh, sometimes you can't even eat. That's how tired we are. You just want to rehydrate, drink a lot of water, drink a lot of Gatorade. And then for some of us, we can't sleep either. It's ridiculous. Like after you get pumped up for that game. Yeah. After you get pumped up for that game and now the game has ended, it's like, Sleep, where are you? I'm tired, but sleep, where are you? You know, so, but that's what we go through. It happens. Tell me, Stephanie, what was the learning curve for you going from officiating matches in Jamaica to the Confederation and international level where you have counterparts who may have had better infrastructure and head starts and resources and opportunities available to them that we may not have in the Caribbean. So how did you, you know, do this come from behind to come on par with them? That was actually an eye opener for me, to be honest. Um, thank God for everything that I learned in Germany. Um, like all of our coaches that we've had um, from developmental stage at the parish level for me with Mark Sullivan teaching me all the things that I needed to know to get to the Premier League level, which is the highest level, the national level in Jamaica. And then the pool of um, instructors that worked with us there, like everything they know, 
from Fitness, Ron Tavern, to Mr. Dave Meikle and Victor Stewart and Mr. Prendergast. Like everything that they learned while they were out there with CONCACAF or from FIFA, they brought back to us and they really did put in the work. Like some days we were like, these guys are crazy, but everything that they gave us, I can say that. When we went out there, we were prepared. If you have the platform and you get to give one piece of advice to the people in charge of football back in Jamaica, based on your experiences about them carving out a space for women and girls, what are you telling them? I would ask them for more support. More support in a sense of resources, um, preparation, you know, to help us further develop ourselves. Like maybe not everyone would have the same mindset as myself, but it, it would be great to have that support behind us or more support behind us to push us further into becoming a better region or to becoming a better country. Um, also the women as well, like we really do need support. And if you get to give just one piece of advice to women and girls about getting involved in football and staying the course, what would it be? Do what you love. Believe in yourself because you can do anything that you set your mind to. Nothing is impossible unless you believe that it is impossible. And don't say anything can't be done until you try it. That's great. You're a role model to so many people. What's it like to be the standard bearer for men and women to go out there? Do you ever stop and think like, wow, this is surreal or this may feel like a lot of pressure. Everyone looking, everyone saying, you know, look at this amazing thing that that, that Stephanie is doing. <laughs> of course, it does feel like a lot of pressure, to be honest. Um, I mean, like, I, I just think that I'm doing my best. I'm being a normal person, but they tell me I'm not a normal person. So I I just really like to have fun doing what I do. And I love to do my best. Like, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. I'm always trying to give excellence of myself. So maybe that's why. But I, I, I do feel a lot of pressure sometimes trying to live up to maybe expectations. I got you. And uh, last question in this segment is, how does it feel to put in the hard work and to see your dreams unfold? It's beautiful. I don't know. <laughs> it really is beautiful. It is unexpected. Because I, I, as I said, like I've n I never expected any of this, but I have surpassed my own expectations, which is why I say to persons, don't give up. Don't doubt yourself. Just do it. Stay in the course. You know, see what is out there than what you are seeing in front of you because you don't know what can happen. Like the world is, they always say the world is a big oyster, but there's a lot out there for you if you just try. Excellent example. When we take yeah. a break, we'll be right back for our rapid round. Okay. So hi, Stephanie. So this segment is going to give us a little bit more insight into who you are. Are you ready? Uh, sure. <laughs> so you have a color in the crayon box. What color are you? Pink. So girly. <laughs> What's the most daring thing you've ever done? Ooh. Become a referee. <laughs> What's on your playlist? <laughs> Ah, uh, many things. Katy Perry Roar, for one. Um, Thunder by Imagine Dragons. Yeah. And what's your favorite song? Oh, 
I'm on top of the world. Imagine dragons. Describe yourself in three words. Okay. Um, bubbly, uh, kind, and a perfectionist. Coffee or bush tea? Coffee. Introvert or extrovert? <laughs> oh, introvert. So tell me three things on your bucket list. Okay, let me think about this. Go to Australia. Um, start a family. And... Hello. I want to become... A, 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 I want to help people. What's your personal motto? Um, one of them, your attitude determines your altitude. What's your favorite thing to eat? Sushi. You find a magic lamp with a football genie inside. What are the three things you're asking for? Uh, better football for women. <laughs> More support. Um, and this one is probably personal. Reduce crime in the world. Crime and violence against women in the world. Yes. Okay. What three items are you taking with you to a deserted island? Water. You get to take um, two more. <laughs> oh, I, I need food. So, um, a deserted island. Uh, huh? I don't know. I just, I know food and water is very much important. Okay. So you're not taking your cell phone. You're not taking books. You're not taking a football, anything. No cell phone. No, any peace. <laughs> Got you. And the last question is when you return home from traveling, what's the first thing you look forward to doing? My family, actually like spending time with my family and my dogs. <laughs> and that's all the time we have for this conversation. Thank you, Stephanie, for joining us, for being a good sport and for being a bright spark in our Caribbean Football Union community. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. <laughs> Take care. Thanks for going the distance with our conversation with referee assistant Stephanie Dale Yeasing. Tell your friends to catch this space as we continue to support and celebrate our women and girls in Caribbean football. Conversations is brought to you by the CFU, where our watchwords are passion, purpose, and performance. Until next time, I'm Mikkel Brand Challenger. Thanks for watching.